Hi, welcome to Bernard's Book Club. And the book that we've been looking at is The Dawn of Everything by the Davids, Graeber and Wengro. And I've already said it twice, this is an epic book and I've been looking at it over three films, the first two dealing with ideas and today's final one devoted to an evaluation of those ideas. And there's no doubt that this is a really big book, big in scale, big in its claims and of course big in its word count. It's sold over a million copies and received fantastic reviews and it's a book that many people want to read and those who do often find in its fresh and freewheeling irreverence a kind of intellectual rush where ideas become really exciting, even joyous. But it is also a highly problematic and in many ways a maddening book. Indeed, for some of us, and I include myself here, reading this book has been a bit of a journey really from early exhilaration through to a midpoint fatigue and finally to an after book reappraisal. Which is not to say that this is a bad book. To many of us it was a wonderful book but perhaps it's also a flawed book. And this film will both celebrate what is I think a remarkable book but also set out a really powerful critique which was raised in our discussion and it's a perspective which I've now supplemented with some really good source materials. As in the previous films, it's divided into two parts here called Celebration and Critique, with each part giving five reasons why we might celebrate or question this book. So beginning now with celebration and the first thing that many of us felt was how exciting and swashbuckling the book was, at least in that original flush of those first captivating 200 pages, a blizzard of sweeping dismissals and big claims and categorical statements, all delivered with punk defiance and brazen swagger. And many of us felt transgressive pleasure in his takedown of such things as Western arrogance and, as one author put it, the racism dripping from the binaries of simple and complex, savage and civilised, backward and advanced notions of human progress. And it was at times really exhilarating the way that the book brushes aside these and other targets seemingly conquering all before it in a tour de force of provocative and anarchic disruption. So that's the first reason for the book's appeal. And a second reason comes with the glimpse it offers of the remarkable ways our ancestors have lived. So that for me it was a truly captivating and at times almost mind-blowing tour of the unknown and the unexpected, a magical mystery tour, if you will, of social anthropology and human history in a collection of stories full of drama and spectacle over a huge canvas of time and space, bringing into view people and societies, more in keeping with the imaginings of science fiction than the dry debates of traditional archaeology, in a great tapestry of human experience of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the good, the bad and the ugly are all over this book, as well as the dramatic and the unexpected, in a survey of human history as a wondrous list of places and people that none of us knew even existed. Places like the huge circular settlements of the Ukraine, there long before anything resembling a city, where thousands lived over centuries without a political centre or any kind of overlord or the enormous ancient earth mounds of America built with highly sophisticated principles of geometry. Then there's the egalitarian cities and popular assemblies of Mesopotamia, again there long before the famed kingship for which that region is best known. 
Or there's the great city of Teotihuacan, whose grandeur was on a par with Rome, but whose wealth and power was directed not to empire, but to social housing, as well as other great spectacles, such as the megalithic stone temple of Gobekli Tepe, whose 200 supporting pillars celebrate in sculpture, masculinity, violence and killing and a multitude of other societies, some of which were run by philosopher-democrats and others by ball-playing aristocrats. And there's even a shamanic empire and a tiny late Neolithic settlement which invents bureaucracy in order to help with its collective life. And just knowing that these existed is itself a wonderful thing. And this is just some of what's presented. And it's all there. It's got everything, a real life Game of Thrones, but with less killing and much more creative possibility where the surprises keep coming and keep speaking to our imagination as a multitude of lives and the meanings that are given to those lives become exemplars of human possibility. And some of which are so compelling, so enthralling that they could have been great books in their own right. And of course, I'm thinking here of the great standout, the indigenous critique, and its wonderfully transgressive thesis that the indigenous people of North America were, if not the real authors, then a hugely significant influence on what we know today as the European Enlightenment which is also a story of the great political and philosophical achievements of those indigenous people of North America, and which, more than any other part of the book, captivated almost all of us and very much powered the book's early momentum. And another standout, at least for me, was the whole complex of ideas around the work of Maria Gimbertus, The Rise of Heroic Societies, patriarchy and sexual violence. So here then is the second reason for the book's appeal, which itself leads to a third in the way that the book speaks to our concerns. And so although the book is intentionally playful, its wider concerns are very serious indeed. And the big part of why this book has held the attention of so many is because in many ways it speaks to and reflects deep existential concerns about our life, our society and our world, so that when the Davids say we are stuck, it really resonates. And for many of us, the book speaks to a deep need for a different understanding of our life and our world. So that's the third reason why the book has so much appeal. And as well as that, a fourth reason to celebrate is because it does a really great job waking up our desire to know our deep past, revitalising a sense of awe and wonder in our human story, told over vast distances of time and space. And finally, a fifth reason to think highly of this book is because it disrupts old orthodoxies and gives us new ways to think. And in this sense, the book is a huge intellectual project of creative destruction, disrupting, redefining and decentering who gets to speak their history and how we should understand such things as cities and the whole idea of civilization. And following such books as Amitav Ghosh's The Great Derangement and Peter Frankopan's The Silk Roads, it also, like those books, decenters world history away from the focus and the distortions of Western power. So these then are five reasons why many of us really liked this book. It was exciting and swashbuckling. It was a tour of the unknown and unexpected. It spoke to our concerns. It revitalised a sense of awe and wonder. And it disrupted old orthodoxies, giving us new ways to think.
And even if the critique that follows proves to be correct, the book still remains a really strong intervention, opening up all sorts of intellectual space to engage with the really excellent questions generated as much by the book's flaws as by its many great qualities. And as stated, the book does have many serious flaws, which takes us now to part two and the criticisms of the book, where there are five problems which are there to match the five great reasons to celebrate the book. And the first of these is what one of our group called the sogginess of the book, which is to say that most of us felt this to be a book that began bright, but did become quite hard going and its early momentum was compromised by spiralling excursions, often into speculation, which on one hand were at times brilliant, but on the other required a real lot from the reader. So that early rush of those first 200 pages gives way to something much more demanding, like a long jazz concept album spinning off into spontaneous brilliance but with a few too many drum solos. A second and much more important criticism, probably the most important, and it's certainly one that I've been very reluctant to embrace, is over the book's academic credibility in general and as a work of social anthropology in particular. And this was raised in our discussion by one of our group with a background in social anthropology and subsequently I found it set out systematically and I have to say rather brilliantly in the wonderful YouTube channel Political Anthropology What is Politics where its presenter effects a takedown of the book's academic credibility with the very same playful swagger as our authors now on the receiving end had been doling out to the likes of Pinker and Diamond. That is to say, he doesn't hold back in over five hours of detailed critique, explanation and compelling argument. And it's a great performance and what comes from it is a rather extensive list of what can only be called intellectual slights of hand, including the misrepresentation of authors and ideas, to create a series of straw men and cartooned arguments, which they then counter with cherry-picked evidence, ignoring huge volumes of recent work which runs counter to their thesis, to finally overplay and overstate their ideas and their argument, whose conclusions are very much at odds with the scholarship and the consensus of contemporary social anthropology, and most importantly, contrary to the overwhelming weight of evidence. Now, these are really serious accusations, the details of which I've no room here to elaborate and over which I'm in no position to adjudicate. I can only really say that I was impressed with his argument and with the evidence he gave to support it, and you would have to decide for yourself. And beyond this, there are other less damning but just as interesting academic objections, including perhaps surprisingly the range of human history that Graeber and Wengro managed to cover, concentrating as they do with our last 40,000 years, when critics say there's ample evidence to go much further back, such that one author suggested its title would be more accurate if decidedly less swashbuckling if it were to be called the tea time of everything. Another really interesting academic concern is that much of Graeber and Wengro's argument is in some senses anachronistic. That is to say, their arguments and ideas are out of time, full of modern conceptions, which might be ill-suited to understand our deep past. And this comes from another really impressive YouTuber, Mark Vernon, who tells us that Graeber and Wengro present human nature through an utterly modern image of the self-reflective and empowered decision maker freely choosing how to live, which is their view of our nature as self-conscious, rational and autonomous beings from the beginning possessed with agency. 
And in many ways, this is really attractive. And for me, it was one of the things that pulled me into the book. But as a way to understand our deep past, a past which Vernon tells us is flooded with spiritual meaning, at the very least, there is something problematic here, and for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because their conception of what it is to be human is quite specific and arguably pretty narrow. And secondly, because ideas from a humanly empowered secular now are not that useful to understand what Vernon calls the spiritual commons of then. It's attractive, but it assumes that our consciousness and our relationship to the world has remained the same over time, that we were always and from the beginning self-reflective and empowered decision makers freely choosing how to live. But for Vernon, the human imagination of the deep past would more likely have been inspired, possessed even, by the world about them in an existence where human desire and human will look toward becoming participants in nature in a much larger, much deeper conception of the multiplicity of life, rather than towards any modern notions of mastery and human agency. So for all of these reasons, there is at least a serious challenge out there that would cast Graeber and Wengro in an image of false academic prophets mesmerising us and turning our gaze away from significant and serious scholarship and potentially even creating a new state of nature myth populated not with Hobbesian bad human nature or its Rousseauian mirror myth of good human nature but a new myth of humanity as freewheeling choice makers. So that's the second and by far the most significant potential problem with the book. And I think it's at this point where the intellectual critique flows into a political one, bringing us to a third potential problem in that some, and I have to emphasise only some, find the book politically unhelpful. Now, this requires some explanation. As to say that it's politically unhelpful is to ask the question, politically unhelpful for who? And the answer to that question is that this is an objection from the left and it's made in the name of equality and therefore is only one small part in a larger field of ideas, ideologies and movements. And I'm also really sensitive to the fact that in an age of state power and lockdowns, arguably freedom is of supreme importance. Indeed, for some of us, it was the book's emphasis on freedom which was so refreshing. But, say those who want to make this argument, and whose views I emphasise again will not be shared with everyone, this is, after all, a political book with a highly political message which presents itself squarely in the tradition of what might be called emancipatory politics. And in so doing, they make the charge that not only might their conclusions be intellectually misplaced, but politically, their recommendations might set back the very emancipatory politics they so clearly seek to advance. In part, this is an old debate between rival anarchist and socialist conceptions of human possibility and human liberation, between an anarchist emphasis on freedom and a socialist emphasis on equality. Though it's important to say, while these differences are important, there is huge common ground between them. They both embrace freedom and equality, albeit with a different emphasis, and they still very much share and are united in a commitment to emancipatory politics. And it's striking how many of those who criticise this book do so with a heavy heart, citing not just Graeber's authority as an activist, but the respect they have for his work. But having said that, they do have serious and well-documented objections, arguing that the book denigrates equality, 
and elevates an abstracted idea of freedom which is blind to context or circumstance and whose offer to emancipatory politics is more likely to be as a source of distraction and false hope. And this, of course, is why they argue that the book is politically unhelpful. And it's these two charges that the book denigrates equality and elevates freedom, which are the final two objections, objections four and five, to the book. So turning to equality, and again only for those who share this political line of argument, and it starts with the idea that Graeber and Wengro have a kind of hostility to the very idea of equality, claiming it to be not just a weak and empty concept, but a fairy story fit only for children, because they argue there was no time before inequality, and to believe that we, as a species, spent 95% of our history in egalitarian bands is to be in the presence of a myth, and very much what the Davids had in mind when they declared we should bid farewell to humanity's childhood. But for all the references made by the Davids to recent research, their social anthropological critics accuse them of ignoring a huge amount of it, and in particular failing to engage with an enormous body of new scholarship on human evolution and careful and well-documented arguments about human adaptation which are transforming the study of human evolution and human history and which is now arguing because early humans were small and vulnerable in order to survive they had to learn to share and cooperate and to learn to share and cooperate they had to learn to be equal which is to say that not only is equality a meaningful concept it was actually our principal strategy for survival and key to our becoming recognisably human, evolving ways to overcome the dominance hierarchies of our ape ancestors, because to become human and to succeed as a species, we had to reject non-human hierarchy. In other words, we became human by becoming equal. Now, this is the argument of Christopher Bohm, a leading authority in this field, arguing that our move to sharing and equality was culturally and consciously achieved. And this, of course, fits really well with Graeber and Wengro's argument that we are self-reflective and empowered decision makers. And they quote Bohm approvingly as one of the first thinkers who recognised political choice in early humans only to express bewilderment and disappointment that Bohm went on to insist, as does the rest of social anthropology, that once our species arrived and we did become recognisably human, we did not choose to return to hierarchy and we stayed that way for 95% of our history, even though, as Bohm argues, we did this in an infinite variety of ways. Now for Graeber and Wengro, this amounts to letting humanity down, or in their words, casually tossing early humans back into the Garden of Eden. But there are lots of problems with this view, and perhaps the most obvious is that in a world of choice, why would anyone from a peaceful and equal society choose to live in inequality and violence, surely they would have had to be compelled to do so. That is to say, it was compulsion and not freedom at play here. Which brings us to the final objection, that it elevates an abstracted and unreal idea of freedom. And that's because in human affairs there is always a context for choice and never absolute freedom. And Graeber and Wengro know this, telling us perhaps Marx put it best that we make our own history but not under the conditions of our own choosing. And they go on to say that the intersection of environment and technology 
does make a difference. With each new invention, they argue, opening up social possibilities that did not exist before. So that it is undoubtedly true, they tell us, that over the broad sweep of history, we find ever larger and more settled populations and ever more powerful forces of production and people spending more of their time under someone else's command. But for their anthropological critics, these concessions to circumstance and the recognition that these set the parameters to our freedom are brief and quickly forgotten. Like their denigration of equality, their lionisation of freedom is categorical and absolute, making them, as one author has it, deeply uninterested in the environment and the material basis of human existence preferring to ignore significant work on the environmental and technological limits to human choice. Because to think about how such things as technology and ecology and geography and population density constrain our freedom would be to challenge the purity of their vision of absolute human choice. And this is important for many reasons. It's important because inequality, hierarchy and violence do not arise from human choice, but rather require compulsion. And this is only possible under particular circumstances. Circumstances where the environmental and practical conditions give some people advantage over others by enabling them to control resources that those others need. And for all the complications and time lags that Graeber and Wengro rightly point out to our adoption of agriculture, this is the reason why so many past and present scholars link agriculture and inequality. And again, here the evidence is against the Davids, with recent scholarship demonstrating a deep and complex relationship between agriculture and inequality, tracing the very many ways that it has led to inequality in many different parts of the world. And beyond a solitary quote whose logic is completely ignored, Marx and capitalism are nowhere to be found in this book. Because to argue that human societies are embedded in wider structures of power would be to violate Graeber and Wengro's sacred image of humanity as freewheeling choice makers. This is why Graeber and Wengro cannot answer their own question, how did we get stuck? Because their flawed theoretical model is blind to existing power structures and cannot see the whole picture. And from flawed analysis comes flawed politics, a kind of misdirected voluntarism, unwilling to see the realities of power, as if somehow we become free by simply declaring ourselves to be free. So, there we are. That's a very complete and very comprehensive, even damning critique of a soggy book that lacks academic rigour, is politically unhelpful, denigrates equality and elevates an unreal and abstracted idea of freedom. Yet, despite all of this, because I've seen weaknesses in their arguments, does this mean that the book has nothing to teach or inspire with? I don't think so, because for me, despite all of these flaws, this remains a wonderful book. As one reviewer put it, a howling wind of fresh air, which for all of its faults, many of us, though not all in our book club, really did find this an exciting, swashbuckling tour of the unknown and unexpected, speaking to our concerns, revitalising a sense of awe and wonder, and disrupting old orthodoxies which for my part has taught me a great deal, even if now some of that learning is now as much through critical response.